Assalamu alaikum, what's going on everyone? So today I had the honor and privilege to talk to Sheikh Shanawi and he is from Yikansa too and we had an amazing conversation. We talk about halal dating, halal risk, how to make money in this day and age and we also talk about the miracle and gift of life and Sheikh Shanawi had so many incredible stories to share. So be ready, stay tuned. I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this episode. So what are you passionate about? On the first date, just like that, you're going to yeah. ask the question? <laughs> first date right away. What are you passionate about? Bismillah. Uh, life, uh, family, uh, sharing Islam, uh, which informs my approach to life and family, uh, sharing Islam with the world. Nice. So what kind of, like, obviously, were you born Muslim? What got you into Islam? And what kind of got you into becoming a quote-unquote sheikh, right, of Islam? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh my parents were devout Muslims. Um, that is a huge blessing. I can't thank God enough for. That was my anchor because I had to um, go on my own personal self-discovery phase as a teenager. I remember clearly uh, sitting down with my mom outside the building and saying, like, Mama, you know, with all due respect, I got to ask something, you know. Uh, every parent tells their child, this is the right way. So what well, makes us any different? Because, you know, we actually lived in Borough Park, which is known as the Tel Aviv of Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. Of the United States, even. And so, like, 94% uh, of our neighborhood was uh, Hasidic Jews, ultra-Orthodox, you know, uh, Jews. And so they seem to be as convinced, committed to their faith as we were to ours. So that was already a challenge, just observing that. Um, and then I went to public school my whole life. And so they also seemed equally convinced that no faith is worth our attention or worth being, you know, uh, brought out into the daylight, you know, public life. And that's the secular paradigm. So everything was pushing back against the Islam being this exceptional uh, authentically traceable way of God. Yeah. And so she said to me something along the lines of, of course, our faith, faith is the truth. Just trust me. Uh, and that was the exact answer I could not hear as a 13-year-old <laughs> in Borough Park, in public school in New York City. And so I, I never left Islam. Alhamdulillah. I'm Alhamdulillah. Very, very grateful. I'm not going to sort of dramatize this and how like I came back to the faith and whatnot. <laughs> but I, I honestly went on about a 10-year journey of trying to figure out why am I Muslim? Do I have any good reason to be Muslim? Is it just blind faith? Is it just inherited dogma? Uh, is it just wishful thinking? Um, am I just socialized into this faith? And uh, I even had greater incentive to do that because along this journey, 9-11 happened. And so there goes any social perks yeah, of <laughs> for being, being Muslim. Muslim. So yeah. I needed a really good reason. And, you know, fast forward 10 years later, I realized that I was holding Islam to much higher standards than every other system I was comparing it with because I'm trying to offset my bias, right? So yeah. I realized, wait a minute, I'm actually being tougher on Islam than every other system, faith system, belief system, worldview out there. And Islam is still winning. You know, so it was mind blowing for me the exceptional nature of Islam. So call me a, a, a reborn, <laughs> a renewed, uh, a conscious Muslim, and every Muslim, you know, uh, needs to understand that uh, you have to be conscious and intentional about whether you have chosen Islam or not. And especially in this day and age, more than ever, with sort of the exchange of ideas happening in unprecedented ways through technology, through globalization, uh, it's crucial. Or else, you know, there's a a famous uh, Arabic adage I came across over the years that depicts one of the greatest tragedies of life. And they always depict things in desert terms in Arabia, yeah. po Arabian traditional Arabian poetry. And it says, as we watch the camel die in the middle of the desert alone out of thirst while it's carrying buckets of water on its back. Yeah. So like, imagine you go through life and walk away from your Islam and sort of dabble and experiment with everything else out there that will be far less fulfilling and you had it with you all along. And so that's like always my prompt to every Muslim. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to discover for yourself because Islam is that. The system which the more you ask, the more you'll actually be intellectually convinced. And then sort of the spiritual experiences after that will further solidify your certainty.
It's yeah. both sort of persuasion and practice. Together, they bring about a conviction that is unparalleled anywhere in the world. Yeah, I love that answer because even for me as a 25-year-old right now, I remember when I was 13, starting to ask my mom and Bob, like, so why are we right? Because I go to school with a bunch of Christians and they seem like they're team positive that they're right. They're yeah. doing the Christmas and the Halloween and all these yeah. things because when you're a kid, you're just learning, learning, learning and soaking up all this knowledge, information. And you're thinking, okay, so why are they right? Why are we right? Why are we wrong? Why are they wrong? And the more you ask that question, my dad would tell me these things like, Look at the way they live their lives. Look at the way we live our lives. What do we do? We go to the mosque. We do we pray. We do these things, right? Do these things make you better or worse? And I'm like, make me better. Okay, so just keep doing it. And if you feel, like you said, something else out there is better, then yeah, go there. But until you find that, stay with Islam. I was like, okay, that's fair, right? That's, it challenges the 13-year-old to be like, mm. okay. But even then, like fast forward high school into college, I didn't have the same feeling until kind of like I went abroad and studied abroad in England when I was a junior. And being alone, no one there, no mama, no bubba, no friends, you family. You had to own it. You had to be, who, who am I, right? Mm-hmm. And that's when you start to ask yourself, who am I? Who do I want to be as a man, right? Because then you're 20 years old, 21 years old, you start really kind of going through it. And I was like, I'm Muslim, you know? And then you start realizing, okay, my first Ramadan away from home, away from family, fasting every day, making sure I pray, doing all these things. And then realizing, wait, this is who I am. And this kept me solid. And anytime I went through struggle, hardship, and then went, like, held on to my faith in Dean, I got pushed through it way faster than the average person. And mm. I thought, huh, this is definitely getting me going. And then fast forward two years, and then you, you fall in love with it spiritually. And it's, I think something that I always loved is that you, it's okay to go habba habba, right? When you dive back into it 100%, you're not going to be from... 100% sinner to 100% faithful, perfect Muslim. It's no such thing as perfection. So I, I love to see even hear like how everyone's journey kind of is that ask questions, ask questions, and you have to keep asking questions. Because no such thing as blind faith. It's you have faith with conviction. There's mm-hmm. a sense of knowledge. There's the Quran that we read, and there's so many scientific miracles and all these things that make you think, ah, yes, you know, you just die fully in. No, your story is way more interesting than mine. <laughs> <laughs> way more sellable. Uh, and... Yeah, just spot on. It, 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 very much true. I mean, we don't, we have blind submission in Islam, mm-hmm. not blind faith. And the way I, I try to explain the difference to people is that God gave me a mind, it would be ungrateful to kick that to the curb and not use it. Uh, so I should check is there water in the pool before I take the jump, right? Yeah. Uh, but once I know there's water, I know water causes people to float. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that sounds horrible because that could mean drown as well. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the idea that we check after you check further, you know, uh, reinforce it with the experiential faith, the faith based on experience, and that's a completely different level. No, I love that. And do you think that once you had a family, you entered a different level of faith? Absolutely. I mean, in, in many different ways, you're striking a chord here. I don't know who told you to ask these questions, but they're <laughs> the right questions. <laughs> you know. Uh, becoming a parent, for instance, uh, forces you to pause. And, and there's so many people that you know, you know speak on this, write about this from all walks of life. There's a reason why they call it the miracle of life, right? Yeah. I, I always recall my firstborn. I'm in the hospital and sort of like after the the, the trauma of like the, the, the fight or flight, adrenaline is pumping, you're helping your wife sort of keep it together and she yeah. has the baby and then things are calming down. I'm just like, hold up. When did my wife <laughs> have another human being inside her, like a human, a yeah. living? When did one soul become two souls? And you sit there and you almost lose it. Yeah. Like, I know my wife. My wife's alive. My wife is a person. She has personhood. She's been yeah. sold. When did one soul become two? Right? There's no scientific explanation for this. Yeah. Right? There is an unseen element here. We all know. Scientists and laymen know there's a difference between also think of the, the back end of life between the, the living human and the corpse. What is the difference? Mm-hmm. You can sort of measure they're colder and whatnot. But what is the difference? Explain to me. Yeah. We know there's a difference between a living being and a rock, a living being and a corpse. And that that was mind boggling for me. It's just like, yeah, this is this is you can't just chalk this up to sort of the splitting of cells. Like, how did that become cells split and then mm-hmm. they sort of uh, embryogenesis and then uh, f- f- feature distinction? That's like, you know, how did they win the game? They hit the last shot. No, but how did they hit the last shot? They were triple teaming them, right? Yeah. You're choosing to pick it. Like, someone tells me I believe in Big Bang. Yeah. That's not an explanation. 
who caused the Big Bang to explode. <laughs> yeah, there has right. to, it's like there's always something before, before, before. And there so, is a, a sort of a, to, it is blind. And it's part of the dogma, the blind faith of our age in secular materialistic times that, you know, you want to believe. That's completely blind faith, the fact that you want to believe that science can explain everything. And this is sort of like the fallacy of scientism, this notion that science can explain all things. Like the, the, the Big Bang exploded. How did it explode? Oh, the gases combusted. Who created the gases? Yeah. You know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you can't just explain from the middle of the story. You actually don't have an explanation. Yeah. You, and you just don't want to admit that. And so that was huge for me. And I remember actually there was a very famous, well-spoken uh, ophthalmologist, atheist, whose name is Dr. Lawrence Brown. He's a Muslim now. He's authored many, many books. Um, for those interested, one of them is called Guided, like Guided. Mm-hmm. And Misguided is another book he has. Yeah. Uh, misguided. Um, and he actually has a personal story. And the personal story is that he was this outspoken, staunch, you know, combative, polemical, you know, philosopher of an atheist uh, or atheist philosopher. And he had his first child and she was on the brink of uh, dying on her first day in life, right, in the hospital. And so he, he broke down. He broke down and he said he ran to the chapel of the hospital and he said, God, listen, I'm begging you, please. Like, if you're there, if you exist, just save my baby. If you save my baby, I promise you, wherever I find you, I'm all in, right? And the idea there is, someone could say, oh, it's subjective or sort of, a, you know, he reverse engineered sort of the, the medical sort of yeah. miracle that happened. But the idea is that when you try to claim that all things can be, you know, understood in our human terms or in the mater- the physical, tangible, materialistic world or whatnot, you're basically assuming that we're all gods. Yeah. We're in control. And life will teach you very fast. But you're whether not. through the vulnerability you feel as a, as, a, as a parent or whatever else, you're not God. Mm-hmm. And then you want, you start looking for your rock. You start looking for your corner. Like, okay, if I'm not in charge, who's in charge? Someone's got to be in charge. Why does someone have to be in charge? Why does it have to make sense? Why does there have to be relief? Because there's something inside you making you sure of that. A lot of times, just to the heedlessness of society, sort of, we're just indulging and everything else. We're, we're, we're you know, blindfolding ourselves from that, you know. Uh, and that's the real problem. It's not like the absence of signs for God, the absence of miracles. It's the presence of heedlessness. I have a teacher. He has a, he has a really cool analogy that I, I love about this issue. He's saying people are always saying, show me miracles. If I were to slap this wooden table right now and pull out an apple, what would you call that? Would you call that a miracle? He says, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like <laughs> I was like, why? Why would you call that a miracle? He says, because like tables don't make apples. Yeah. Why? It's made out of wood. He goes, yeah, exactly. Well, apple comes out of wood all the time. It's uh, called a branch. That's, that's brilliant. I was like, wow, that's actually very uh, classy. And so we see it so much that we've sort of developed a desensitization. We're not thoughtful people anymore. We're just in the jungle, the concrete jungle of life. And so for those that their glass house gets shattered and God opens up for them an opportunity to just pause. The signs are innumerable. The signs are countless. Um, one, the great Imam Jafar bin Muhammad, one of the great scholars of, of early Islam and great-grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they told him, how do we know there's a God? He said, have you ever been on a ship? And this is a Quranic theme. It's all yeah. throughout the Quran. And so he basically rehashes it to them. He goes, have you ever been on a ship? And things are just going bonkers. The storm and like the Ships waves swaying. and you like your life. You know, they say there's no atheists in foxholes, right? Those bomb shelters yeah, yeah, yeah. in the middle of the wars, right? Those ditches. He says to him, and you're sure that you're going to die, but you're also sure that there's someone there that if he wanted to save you, could save you. They said, yes. He said, that's God. Why are you so sure? Where do we get this hope from? Right. Of course, that faith is accentuated and fortified through the revelation God reveals through having a relationship with Him. But at at the very heart of it, this is what Islam tells us. By the way, that's called your fitra. That's, that's your nation, mm-hmm. your your nature, your the way you're born, the way your your factory settings. Yeah. You are incapable, actually, of disbelieving in God. You can just keep telling yourself there's no God, or that God's not worth paying attention to, or they're irrelevant. And they're like the deist theory of like He created the universe, spun it into action, and you know. Yeah. But that doesn't add up if you're paying attention. Yeah. 
And I always tell people that too. Like at the end of the day, you have to believe in something. Like, and I noticed this. And again, being 25, you notice all the different things that are happening in our society, right? Where you have people kind of saying, "These stones, these crystals will protect me. Oh, uh, uh, I manifest these things. I do this. I do that." But then, as I look at all this, I'm like, in a way, like you're. It's like you're so close yet so far. Like it'll be, oh, I wake up at 5 a.m. to meditate. You wake up at 5 a.m. to pay treasure, you know, and then it's like I manifest, but manifestation to us is asking Allah for things. So it's yeah. like there's so many synonymous things where it's like you're so close because they you're call it ins- a metaphysical yearning. Like there's a yearning for something beyond the physical that is universal in human beings. Mm-hmm. It's just it permeates us all. It's like, why do we, why are we all like that? Why do we all feel this way? It's like a spiritual realm that we all, like you said, the fifth world, you believe in it, your inclination to worship. And I tell people, I'm like, you'd be surprised, like, oh, oh, he's so successful. He says he wakes up at 5 a.m. every day, and first thing he does, he expresses gratitude. And then I laugh because that is like a key premise of Islam, even Christianity, Judaism, most religions, is express gratitude to God. Mm. And it's so funny because then they'll be like, oh, how is he so successful? I started changing the way I thought. I changed my wiring of my brain. I decided being grateful for every blessing, if it's bad, if it's good. But then in Islam, we learn, you say alhamdulillah for everything and alhamdulillah twice for bad things. And all these different little things you learn. And by the way, the without cutting you off, this is also of the uh, the shackles of materialistic thinking, which we, people have no choice. If you sort of don't accept anything in the secular godless era, except that which you sort of can put within the reach of the five senses, the empirical, right, the, the scientifically yeah. accessible, the tangible, right, the physical world in general. Uh, that is also why you think you know why you succeeded, right? Like the, the whole idea in, in modern times of like interviewing and giving a book contract to someone who is, has made a lot of money, you actually have no reason to believe. It's just you, you, you're taking a shot in the dark. You're grasping at straws through the fog. Yeah. Do we actually know that Elon Musk is that much smarter than everyone else? Like, does it really correlate mm-hmm. with sort of his uh, his portfolio, financially speaking? It doesn't. Mm-mm. We just it's dogma. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, it must have been because of this. It must have been because of that. And as they say, correlation doesn't always necessitate causation. It's not necessarily the reason. And that is why the the God factor is indispensable. You know, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu he has a very beautiful answer to a man who asked him, مَا بَالُوا أَكْثَرُ الْحُكَمَاءِ فُقَرَاءِ Why is it that most wise people tend to be broke? Because like you think, the wiser you are, the more money you're supposed to be bagging. Like, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, yeah. it should correlate. He told them, how come most wise men are broke? He said, لِأَنَّ عَقْلَهُ مِنْ رِزْقِهِ Because God provided him with a mind and provided someone else with money. His provision was intellect. His provision was money. It's not you. It's the provider who distributed. You get this and you get that. Mm-hmm. And it's profound. Like if you think yeah. of it, it's up to us and my wit and my sort of accomplishment and, you know, the things I take pride in, you don't actually know why, you know. The variables are too many. The intricacies are imperceptible to the yeah. limitations of the human experience. And I love that because even when it comes down to like books I've read, obviously, that aren't the Quran or anything, and just you know, knowledgeable books about business, about how to be better at life. And one of the things I read was it was explaining – it took a group of geniuses, right? They all had IQs higher than 120. And they took 730 of these geniuses and they were like, okay, let's study them now until 20 years later. Okay, cool. The top 150 were doctors, lawyers. You know what you'd expect. They're geniuses, right? Mm. The middle was, you know, average, like, career, normal, blah, blah, blah. But then the bottom 150, only eight of them graduated college. Then you're thinking, okay, how are they geniuses? High, high IQs over 120, but didn't graduate college? How? Then they took the same list, mm. and they measured them by socioeconomic status. They found the top 150 were the wealthiest, the bottom 150 were the poorest. So their families, the opportunities they were given, yeah, you didn't choose there. what family you got born into, what era you were exactly. born. It's just it is and it came the down arrogance to the, of the yep. modern man, the rise of the ego. And it know? came down to the opportunity that the kid was given. So you give the, that same child here, like some of the kids in like the poorer sections were higher IQs than the richer ones but what got them there was the opportunities and I once I learned that like fully I was like it makes sense then like think about the structural racism and how it disadvantages some or I think advantages others at the disadvantage of some Mm -hmm. it's a reality it's an observable reality that there's more to this mix than just like whatever we want to uh, ascribe it to. I remember Khabib even though I'm not a I'm not a UFC fan (laughs) uh, whatsoever Um, but there was this famous meme going around during his run 
uh, where, you know, if God is with you, no one can defeat you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that meme always bothered me. Yeah. Uh, because it's beautiful that he's ascribing sort of success to God, but success in this world is not necessarily a sign of God being pleased with you. Some, mm -hmm. Most of the rich are corrupt, yeah. right? And God is not pleased with the corrupt, uh, nor with corruption. And so in his, uh, someone shared with me a, uh, his speech or a clip from his speech when he's being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he said, uh, you know, I just want to say that the reason I've always been saying praise be to God, praise be to God, is because God chose me to see whether I will praise him in my moments when the world is praising me, essentially. Mm -hmm. He was saying, because think about it, you can say hard work and this, that, and, and technique. And He goes, but there are many people who work just as hard as me and uh, may have even worked harder than me that are not standing here today. So what do you say about them? And I was like, yes, he fixed it. Not he fixed it. Maybe the meme was sort of yeah. decontextualized or whatnot. But that's very important. Yeah. That is true humility, true deference to God. Uh, that is the way of the believer. Yeah, and I also I remember seeing something about him, and he was asked. I had a friend who, again, like he had a Muslim friend, and he was talking about it. He's like, dude, something I do like about Habib a lot that, again, most people don't realize is that he doesn't sit there and have an apologist mindset where he says, oh, it's not haram. That's not haram. But he's like, no, striking people. And then Habib literally was like, no, striking people in the face is haram. He admitted it. So it's like not being a coward of like hiding behind the, no, 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 no. God alone can judge me, blah, blah, blah. No, no. He stood up and said, no, but it is haram. And that's what a Muslim is. A Muslim at the end of the day submits to God even if he falls short in living by that. Mm -hmm. Submitting to God meaning in principle at least, right? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between uh, like Adam, peace be upon him, the first human being, and uh, Iblis or in biblical language, Lucifer, the devil. The difference between Adam and the devil. Yeah. They both made a mistake, right? Uh, the devil refused to prostrate, and Adam uh, ate from the forbidden tree. The difference is Adam owned it, right? Mm -hmm. And God forgave him and raised him to an even higher rank in the Islamic tradition, even higher rank than he was before, uh, whereas the devil justified it. I don't have to prostrate. What I do is right, not what God says is right. Yeah, like I'm a man. So that's smoke that's fire. all. That's the whole difference in the human experience between, uh, you know, the bare minimum difference between a believer and a disbeliever. A believer accepts God and submits to Him, even if he can't practice that fully. Because Islam is also a journey. You know, it's not an event where you just walk through the door. No, it's a journey. It's a life journey. None of us are perfect, but we climb slowly and slowly, 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 beginning with this is the mountain. Mm -hmm. This is what human excellence looks like. It's defined by God, mm -hmm. right? Not by us. Yeah. Some people, you know, whenever... Everyone's a good person when it's convenient. Whatever the definition yeah. of good is, right? <laughs> but it's when it's inconvenient, are you going to be uh, show that humility and say, even if I'm not living up to this, right is right, wrong is wrong. Objective, impartial, uh, submissive to the creator. Yeah, and being honest with yourself. Because again, I think something that I've noticed over the last couple of years of my life is being accountable, right? And holding yourself accountable for every misstep, every action that you make and not blaming others for your mishap, right? Oh, I got mad because they did this, but I could also control my temper more. And when you have that ideology, you have that perception like, okay, that makes sense. I I can control my outcome. I can't control how someone treats me, but I can mm. control my reaction. And when you one by one learn it, get how to get better you start like you know biting your tongue a little more you start understanding i'm in control of my actions i'm in control of my reality mm -hmm. allah will change things accordingly but you have to again be able to bounce back off of that and i think one by one i've noticed that and it's really cool that you say um the story about adam and iblis obviously it's like he was almost the whole premise is the arrogance like you were saying i'm made out of a smokeless fire mm -hmm. he's made out of what clay he's first wow. racist right <laughs> <laughs> and I'm built different. Exactly. And that's kind of how it was. And I I chuckled when I saw that and I understood it was like another like click where it's like that's why arrogance is such a bad trait because mm -hmm. what trait is that really showing? It's exactly what it believes showed to God. For sure. And it's like cuz then arrogance boastfulness. And then in the Quran it talks about it all the time where it's like don't be arrogant, don't be boastful. And it's like even in Surah Al-Kahf when it talks about the farmer Right? And he's like, oh, I have all this green. I have all this sustenance. Surely God loves me. Surely Allah would only give me more in the afterlife. Yeah. You know, so again, it shows that so many like different stories show that arrogance would only lead you to failure. You know, Surah al kahfa you just had me reflecting. Uh, I've been thinking about COVID recently and how fast we forget and things like this. 
he was saying, look at these assets I have, look at this estate, you know, and look at how the water runs between them. He's actually sort of bragging of like his passive income, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And he's bragging about like his uh, his flawless supply chain, if you want to borrow some modern terms. Yeah. And then COVID happened and said everyone's meetings are canceled. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. You could be the biggest, baddest entrepreneur in the world. The meeting is canceled. Yeah. You know, flights get grounded. Uh, ships aren't, you know, uh, um, transporting the containers anymore. Yeah. All like that. God happens. is great. Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer. May Allah have mercy on his soul. He says, I used to say, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. And then God gave me this disease to teach me that he's the greatest. Mm -hmm. Right? He had Parkinson's. You know, the man that had surgical, you know, p precision, the man that had, you know, I'm not a fan of boxing either. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this lightning speed, he was a legendary athlete and a great human being overall. I mean, refusing, Very intelligent refusing to go to Vietnam and sort of uh, walk away from both of his title belts and go to prison. And uh, But in the end, though, had he done all that he did in boxing, and had he done all that he did even on the humanitarian front, if you don't give God his due credit, he doesn't need it, but he is owed it. It's a matter of justice, right? Then you actually haven't really done anything good in your life. It's plagiarism. You're ascribing it to yourself when you're not the source of it. You're not mm -hmm. even the source of your own existence. Yeah. You're not even the reason why you keep your bowel move movements intact until you get to a toilet. Like, we can't do anything on our own. Yeah. And so the fact that at the end of his life, God blessed him with the tremors, right? He couldn't even keep it together physically, let alone the orientation mentally. And he's like, God gave me this to teach me that he's the greatest. That was his greatest accomplishment. And he always says that. It was so you know? amazing that he took that. Because like, that lesson could be taken millions of ways, right? Anyone's perspective. But the way he took it was, Allah is giving me this as a blessing. Because yeah. I'd rather be punished in this world than the next. And I think that's beautiful. And I kind of wanted to go off that and ask you, because we were talking business, all these things. Mm. In our 2024 society, right? Like mm. you're saying, your ship containers, oh, no more travel, no more this. Halal risk is one of the most like difficult things to talk about nowadays because it's, again, stigmatized where money is out there to be made all over. But are you willing to sell your morals? Are you willing to sell your soul? Are you willing to sell your, your discipline, your values for a little bit of coin? So what do you think right now about like getting into halal risk and wanting to have success in this world and the next? And what would be your advice about that? It's a huge subject. Uh, a few major principles that Islam uh, carves in the Muslim personality. The first of them is that, uh, what is it is? You know, it is Allah's name is al razaq the perpetual provider, and we have nothing except that it's from Allah. So widen your conceptualization of risk, right? Having peace of mind. Is risk. Uh, is risk having, you know, uh, warmth in your mother's hug, right? Mm -hmm. she, you didn't have to have that mom. And she didn't have to be alive till today, right? These are things God is providing you with. He's constantly, actively, perpetually providing. That's number one. Number two, the greatest risk, if you want to sort of like just bifurcate in a simple way, is the the spiritual provisions, what he provides for you spiritually. Because like, what is the point of like my, my assets increasing when my lifespan is forever decreasing? Yeah. Right? Like what, what is really the value of that if we... Uh, constrict our notion of rizq to just the, the wealth we amass. Yeah, like pieces of paper. <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, you know, people spend their lives just chasing money, and that's like a horrible uh, prevalent ideology, which is careerism. The buy-all, end-all is sort of my uh, my ascent uh, in the, on the career ladder. For what exactly? Like, at what expense also? Like, you're going to miss out on this world, which is horrible. It's, it's torturous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you'll also miss out on the next, uh, potentially. A lot of times that is the tr true. It's a very hard trial. So wealth being a trial, uh, it is a means which we should pursue for uh, good ends. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said how excellent is good money, halal money, permissible wealth, uh, in the hands of a good man. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and sort of money seeds power a lot of the time. And so... Be, the best risk is to have this uh, spiritual uh, import from God, right? For him to enlighten your soul so that you don't become a monster when you have money. And sometimes, that more, more often than not, that is through limiting the amount of money risk you will come across. That doesn't mean you can't be wealthy. I'm just saying most of the wealthy are corrupt, statistical reality. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so maybe God knows that you are one of the it's the, you're, you're the norm, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to be like Solomon, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. King Solomon 
ha- didn't just have kingdom. He even had the animal kingdom, right? Yeah. But the humility and sort of the harnessing of that towards the pursuit of justice, this is rarity. And God knows that about us. And so for our own good, he gives us by withholding from us sometimes, right? So that's another thing to keep in mind. So you don't cut corners and sort of, you know, break rules to collect risk because that risk would destroy you. The last thing is the modern dynamics are extremely complex. And so on the legal side, now this is the spiritual, which is the most important. Now on the legal legal side, Islamically speaking, there is a built-in mechanism in Islam. One of the five five agreed upon legal maxims in Islam is al-mashaqqa tajlubu taysir, which means that hardships warrant concessions. That doesn't mean whenever there's a little bit of a challenge. No, there are moral challenges. That's what life is about. But when the challenge becomes... Uh, too difficult, and the scholars have a metric for this. I'm just trying to simplify for the sake of our audience today. Um, There is a built-in flexibility in Islamic law that allows for leniency when things become just not pragmatic, just life would be unsustainable, especially when you try to scale a rule like that, right? And so the Quran is filled with this. It's not sort of like, oh, Islam turned out to not be timeless, so let's reform it. It's a very different operation than what you may feel or hear or see in other uh, uh, faiths, you know, there's a reason why, by and large, Islam continues to grow despite the fact that, by and large, Islam and Muslims are resistant to this whole concept of reform. Mm-hmm. You know, Islam has a built-in, you know, uh, resilience and veracity and timelessness, and that's why East, West, pre-modern times, post-modern, it continues to grow. Mm-hmm. So that flexibility is there as well, and so. You would simply, sometimes we just have creativity issues. It's just like, we're not, we don't want to think outside the box. We just want to do whatever is on my doom scroll feed. Yeah. <laughs> right? We need to just, you know, and, and most people, by the way, who, uh, what Peter Thiel's book is called Zero to One. Mm-hmm. It's a, I mean, Peter Thiel is a very controversial person. <laughs> uh, you know, he was one of the uh, the, the major uh, sponsors of the, of the Trump campaign, but he's also one of the founders of PayPal, and he's very successful on the business side. And in a nutshell, he'll kill me if he hears me, but his <laughs> book, Zero to One, in a nutshell, is about everyone's trying to, everyone looks at the one and they want to 10x it. That's called disrupting the model, right? In business, yeah. 10x. He's saying, don't look at the one, look at the zero. Where's the need of the market? Where is it going to be in 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. And then you be the one. Uh, so a little bit of creativity, I would call the Muslims too. And then number two, just the scholarship. The the Islam has it there. You can be told, you know, you have a concession here or just tweak it there. And, you know, I'll I'll give you two very practical examples. There were billions and there continue to be billions of dollars to be made in the halal meat industry. Do you know why there are billions to be made? Because the scholar said this way of sort of the ordinary meatpacking industry mainstreamed in, this, in the States, for example, is impermissible. We can't eat meat slaughtered this way. Mm-hmm. Or it's not slaughtered this way is what they're trying to say a lot of times. It dies before the knife or whatever else. That obstacle, that sort of like haram obstacle, became an opportunity for people to say, okay, how do we create an alternative? To just see the obstacles as opportunities. Yeah. Right? Even on, on the haram side, the legal yeah. side, not necessarily fix, the economic. Fix problems, fix problems equals make money. <laughs> the fact that the vast majority of Muslim scholars today said the hardship does not mount to a level that would allow interest-bearing transactions to be a legitimate pathway to buying homes. Mm-hmm. That was the, the position of almost all scholarship in the modern era, right? The modern banking model, interest-bearing. It's mm-hmm. horrible for the economy. Yeah. That's why, God forbid it, among other reasons. Very oppressive. Yeah. But they held their ground and said, listen, with all due respect, you're not going to die if you rent. You're not going to sort of like uh, die uh, if you pull your money together and figure out other ways to like cost share and stuff. Mm-hmm. Because of that, now you have two, three, four, five, and more sort of Islamic mortgaging. That they're, they're tweaking the model as they need to grow actually to, you know, because the, the banking system is... Uh, not just protected, but prescribed for its policies by the government because, you know, yeah. follow the money trails. And yeah. so they have to become like big players to actually really refine the model to be 110% Sharia compliant, right? Yeah. Uh, compliant with Islamic law, Islamic financial ethics. But in general, like guidance residential, the last time I checked, one of these three or four that many of the mainstream scholars, it's like a $20 billion and it may have doubled since I last checked that number, mm-hmm. right? So there's opportunity there. We need a little bit of creativity. We need to sort of appreciate Islam's timelessness 
uh, and relevance uh, and just gets work. Yeah, and I love that because even for me, a lot of times when I think of business ideas with my brother, I'll sit down, we'll plan things out, journal, different ideas. A lot of the times I look at problems and I think, okay, how can I solve this? But also maintaining my faith because I enjoy business. I enjoyed entrepreneurship all my life. I loved seeing the hustle, the grind, Mm. but I also feel like, like you said, the creativity. Not enough people are going into halal risk ways to make money people think that oh it's hard to make money now yes it is but it's very easy to make money if you're willing to sell out if you're willing to do, for sure that's gonna yeah, always and that's be. why he said like wealth isn't the exact pertaining of oh success right because someone could easily do videos of them dancing or the videos and following trends and mm. doing this and doing that for easy quick cash right yep. to talk on podcasts about the easy clickbait topics or how many how many sexual partners do you have oh, how about this and getting that arguments because people love seeing that beef, mm-hmm. that arguments, the drama, right? That's or as simple as the deceiving clickbait thumbnails, as you said. Exactly. Even- but then to do it the right way, it might take longer, but your soul won't be damaged. And I think that's the I think and your soul will last longer than your body. Yeah. And I think that's something really important for people to realize too. And I think I've noticed that over the last couple of years of my life. And everyone's like, oh, like what if you did this? Hey, what if you did this? I'm like, dude, but then I'm not being who I want to become as a man, as a person, as a Muslim. And I think that's really interesting that you say that. And going off of the mortgages and all these different things, it's so crazy to me sometimes to think how the society is doing something that hurts it constantly, and yet we still pertain into it. Yet economists, I was a finance major right in college, mm. so I'd ask questions, right? And there was an economist, I did like a research paper on it, that basically said that the model of what we have, like the interest and like mm. the mortgage back lending, all these different things, hurts the economy ten times out of ten, and will crash an economy no matter what. Look at Venezuela. Look at Argentina, Everyone's just playing hot potato, right? They're just hoping that it won't be on me the next time. <laughs> and then the yeah, one yeah. guy was like, "The only financial model that I've studied that actually works is the Islamic yeah, model." For sure. And this is a random economist who isn't Muslim, and it was cool for me to see that as someone again when I was going into my faith deeper, and I was like. That's cool. Nice, you know. Alhamdulillah. Absolutely. There is actually a a a resurgence of that uh willingness to consider Islamic uh, you know financial guardrail systems after the 2008 meltdown. I saw there was like a call to papers and people were considering how can we do this and uh, the the powers that be and profit from exploiting everyone else will continue to resist, but but you see it. People are insisting on on their own self determination how to make this better. Even even think of the insurance model. I'm starting to see alternative insurance methods for people uh, because commercial insurance is impermissible in Islam, and uh, for reasons that we can discuss later. But at the end of the day, uh, without the Islamic uh, framing of the of the prohibition, th- apparently I heard from an auditor that the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is medical. Right, and so it's set up in a way to just bleed you, and not even, <laughs> yeah, you know, cut, like you have no choice but to be bled. It just it's set up in a way uh, to uh, to pigeonhole you in that horrible choice, and make you feel like you have two choices. No, if I don't take this choice, I'm sort of going to get bankrupt, and if I do take this choice, it is a very unfair exploitative mechanism for just sucking up the hard-earned finances of the masses no. so islam actually forbids that for certain technical reasons uh so it's profound it's profound to see uh and i'm seeing actually what i meant to say is i'm seeing what's known as cooperative insurance or benevolent insurance models where they put their money in a pool this is like not even muslims you know? yeah, yeah. And this is the sort of the islamic model uh whether they know that or not admit that or not is irrelevant right now where you put your money in a pool essentially and if it's needed uh, it's spent on whoever needs it. And there's a safeguard for no one abusing it, obviously. So the person that goes to the ER every 36 hours or something. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end of the year, we start over. Everybody gets their money back. Hypothetically, I'm oversimplifying, of course. And then we restart the pool. So it's like, I'm only paying for what I'm using or we as a collective are shouldering together. That's why it's called benevolent. Mm-hmm. We're all carrying the load for each other. It's not one person paying a premium no matter what happens, and they already have a system in place to know that they'll be collecting way more than they're dishing out. Mm-hmm. That's why they also never vet you. Insurance companies never vet you when you sign up for like car insurance. Yeah, uh, They'll vet you when you ask them for some money after an accident. Yeah, That's when they have like a thousand and one questions. <laughs> yeah. But can I sign up? Yeah, sure, sign up. I'll take your money. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And going off of that, just again, talking about society and stuff, I wanted to get into the topic of 
marriage and halal dating and dating apps because again as a muslim you obviously any young person wants to get married right we all want to have a partner a spouse someone to be with right it's natural human nature like you were saying the miracle of life can happen through us right so i was looking at a bunch of different apps recently that come up that say like islamic dating muslim dating apps and i remember downloading one and trying and seeing like what what it looks like right and i kind of chuckled because the whole time i'm laughing at my brother and thinking this does not feel right because at the end of the day, it's Tinder or Bumble, but with just more majority Muslim people on it. And I laughed at them because I was like, it's not like I'm swiping on her welly. It's not like I'm swiping on her dad and it's her bubba giving statistics like, my daughter is this, this, da, da, da. And I'm saying, yes, father, like, let me talk to you directly. No, and then individually talking to her. So then where's the welly? You know, where's like that respect and potential like cohesion where it's like I'm making sure I'm respecting you, your family and everything like that. But then I see so much promotion of this and I kind of get mad because mm. i'm like then how are we supposed to do it right and then everyone's like oh just find someone naturally through your family through friends college but then we look at statistics now and we see that mm, i think i think i saw over 50 percent of people now are finding their partner through the internet they're finding their partner through there but there's no third spaces right so for example i'm not going to the a cafe and finding my partner right i'm not going here going there but then if you are going out and meeting people again in this society where do people go out in this society in america mm. right the bar these restaurants, yeah. this place, this place, right? They're meeting people there. So then if as a Muslim, you're not going to these places, then where are you to really meet the one, the person, right? Mm-hmm. But then you have to believe, oh, Allah will bless me, right? But yeah, again, you, you sprinkle some Islamic uh, it's, uh, Allah colors Allah, Allah, on Allah sort of a very me. un-Islamic framework so then, sometimes, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, what do you kind of think about, again, like halal dating, marriage, and in, in this society, and how, again, even in America and the West, over 50% of people get divorced. So how should we kind of tackle this issue okay. as going into it as a Muslim? You're not going anywhere for a while? No, nah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's start there. Uh, the notion of the attrition rate. Uh, w- what is the percentage of people that marry their quote-unquote first love? There's actually a study on this. I think it was uh, University of Pittsburgh that less than 1% of people marry their first love. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Let's unpack that. That means you fell head over heels in love with someone. You disclosed your your deepest, darkest secrets to them. You got very emotionally attached to them. And then it hit the fan. That's what it means. Yeah. Which means now you have trust issues. Now your secrets are a currency with which sort of we, we, we play the vengeance game against each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of that, right? And then marriage. Let's say it actually winds up in a marriage. And then the cycle gets worse each time. So you go into the second relationship that way, then the third relationship that way, and then you actually get married. And then you get married, they don't stay married. And so that notion, even Muslims need to hear this. Like when someone tries to gaslight you and say to you, like, how do you Muslims get married? Like, you guys don't Mm -hmm. date. So that is the dumbest thing in the world, okay? You may want to expletive that. I know dumb is not a bad word. But like (laughs) for a sheikh, it may not be. But really, like it's, Mm -hmm. it's such a moot, irrelevant point. Because you guys date and you stink at marriage. So, like, uh, you don't have the moral high ground here. Yeah. Right? That's okay. I got that out of my system. Now let's move (laughs) on to second base. (laughs) The the second issue here is, uh, is there uh, room for dating in Islam? Yes, there is. After marriage. And that sounds equally crazy now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but really, Islam actually has a mechanism, a very genius mechanism, uh, that the proposal used ha- needs like a filter, needs guardrails, needs a chaperone. Uh, that They call a proposal engagement different terms. They're lost in translation, like cultural context translation. But at the end of the day, there is a getting to know period, mm-hmm. right? In that getting to know period, you are protected from the hormone override. Because mm-hmm. whenever you, ha- you you go through this hormone override, like the oxytocin, you know, bonding, horn, you're bonding, bonding. It's it, you're actually you lose so much of your discernment, mm-hmm. and so you already feel that this is the one, and so you reverse engineer all the justifications why this is actually a compatible one, and mm-hmm. that's not true. That's not true. Uh, and so you're saying, but you're saying marriage before dating. That sounds like just you just set it up uh, and arranged marriages, like. Uh, so that's, there's an important disclaimer here as well. Is Islam okay with arranged marriages? I would reframe. Everyone is okay with arranged marriages. Mm-hmm. Everyone is. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. like, so long as we're not talking about forced marriages, because even Islam is not down with that, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, annulled marriages that were done against the will of the... Yes, the chaperone is there to check 
like compatibility, broad, mm-hmm. you know, strokes. You know, you're going to take care of my girl. Are you coming through the front door? Do you have an STDs? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a stable job? These things are important. Uh, aside from that, they can't tell you you have to marry this person or you must marry this person. No, they're just, they're the filter, mm-hmm. right? To make sure no scum, <laughs> Yeah, you know? Uh, and who better to know than like your family, your father, yeah. whoever and is And so there. they're there to say no with uh, objective reasoning. Mm-hmm. Like if they're being unreasonable, you can take your dad to the local imam or the Islamic court if they were in Islamic court where you live and you, you'd you actually get his sort of uh, his custodianship dismissed. Mm-hmm. If he's saying, no, I don't like them because of their skin tone, mm-hmm. they're beneath us, you know, or something of that nature. No, absolutely not justified. There's certain objective justifications that you, the father is supposed to be looking after his family by checking for. Mm-hmm. That's of the way you protect your family, not just from the elements and the wind, not just from like poverty, but also moral. Moral weakness is a problem as well. Um, okay, so no one's down with forced marriages. Let's get back to arranged marriages. I said everybody's cool with it. It's true. Mm-hmm. Why can't our parents suggest to us? Why not? Well, we accept our friends suggest to us, yo, I think you guys work well together. Yeah, like matchmaker. Oh, yeah. Right? And that's what the app does. The app does it through an algorithm. It's just mm-hmm. an automated, yeah. check that out. Yeah. Right? And so those metrics are bad metrics because they're superficial. They will not pass the test of time, the trials of life, the aging process, a financial lull in your sort of uh, in your adulthood. They mm-hmm. will not. And that's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said a woman is married. When he's speaking to the men, for instance due to her wealth or her beauty or her status or her religion, make sure you pick a woman based on religion. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be some compatibility, like socioeconomic class. There should be some sort of like, mm-hmm. uh, what do you call it, equivalency. Yeah. Like if, if you think that you're going to be able to live after the money honeymoon phase with someone from across the globe that operates in life from a completely different paradigm, right? Like, yeah, they love you and you love them, but they're from, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but in a place where it's okay to walk out in public barefoot or it's okay, or we don't use toilet paper, we use rock, mm-hmm. right? And then you tell us- Different levels of like life. It's like, it's, it's hard to relate. It's incompatible, right? Yeah. And so these things are, but make sure their religion is there, yeah. their religious commitment, their religious belief, their religious values. That's what he said, right? Mm-hmm. These apps, these algorithms, these friends- uh, don't have your best interests in mind the way your parents do, nor are they necessarily measuring by the proper metric either. Mm-hmm. Having said that, does it have to come through your parents? It actually doesn't Islamically. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- it would be wrong to get emotionally attached and go guilt your parents and then sort of your uh, Frankensteining it yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's not going to work. It may work like strong arm wise, but at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself in the same camp as those who did unhinged dating. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So now, however it's arranged, whether you notice each other sort of in public or in the college campus or otherwise, and sort of, I would recommend that you find a middleman Mm -hmm. because I know guys who sort of like uh, were interested or vice versa, and they don't know the other person's married. (laughs) They're just misreading the signal. Yeah. So like save yourself and them the embarrassment by sort of, you know, and that's the importance of community. You know, that's why we tell people come to the masajid and, you know, be close to the Muslim so that you can network. I mean, it's very hard. We are a scattered 1% in the population in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. It's a big continent, and it truly is a struggle, and that's only a a part of the equation of why it's such a marriage crisis. I get it, and I sympathize, and I actually, let me go one step further. I support leveraging technology to network in this way, like Mm -hmm. an actual proper check compatibility, then tell you someone who happens to match. I've seen some good ones. Uh, I don't recall too many of the names right now, but sort of adapting this to align with the more effective God-given framework, right? Yeah. Uh, so the app itself, if it is not just like a, an Islamically tainted or tinted, I'm sorry, a dating app, fine. Apps, I, I mean, I have family members who have successful marriages off of sort of a matrimonial website. Alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. So matrimonial events, matrimonial websites, matrimonial apps, when done correctly, this is a great act of worship. Mm-hmm. We're bringing families together. We're building, building blocks of Muslim society and all that. Okay. So... Your parents recommended them or your friends recommended them, but you, you, you have this pious restraint and you make sure we're going through the proper channels. From there, that whole getting to know phase happens. Then you have the marital agreement. Islam actually staggers it. Uh, it leaves it to culture whether you want to avail yourself the stagger or not, but there's three steps. Mm-hmm. Step one is the getting to know or the proposal or the engagement that I spoke about. Step two is the marital agreement. Some call it the nikah, mm-hmm. some call it the aqd, some call it, you know, get biktab, whatever. That marital agreement means you're technically husband and wife, Mm -hmm. which means you guys can go out together. You guys can hold hands. You can go to a restaurant without a chaperone, like Mm -hmm. whatever it is, right? Yeah. And it is not a full-blown marriage now. So it's different now from the proposal because you have access and you can be alone and you can sort of 
basically get to know each other on a more intimate level and check out, you know, each other's mannerisms also when things are, the stakes are higher and things of this yeah. nature. What's it like? Like out of the honeymoon phase or uh, the potentially tinted glasses. Uh, sometimes the honeymoon phase lingers in this period because yeah. you're still not behind closed doors together. Yeah. And that's the third stage. The third stage when you move in together. When you move in together, there are actually Islamic legal differences, right? Mm-hmm. Like the woman uh, does not have to be spent on Islam unless she's under your roof, right? And so, so long as she's under her dad's roof, the obligation is still on him, right? Mm-hmm. So there actually is a difference. Yeah. If you guys were to break it off also in this middle uh, phase, marital event. dating phase, yeah. uh, the the bridal gift, Islam, requires the man to show his commitment by extending a, bri- a gift of the bride's pleasing, like 5,000, 10,000, mm-hmm. diamond ring, whatever. He would He would have the right to reclaim half of that. Mm-hmm. Or sort of not pay before the moving half. in together. If they haven't moved in, once yeah. they move in, there's sort of the financial rights of spending. The the bridal gift becomes due in full. Also, of course, the respective leadership. You know, it's two way street, right? Respective leadership. She doesn't live in your house. <laughs> she's not sort of available to you. She's not part of sort of your. Uh, she's not on your boat. Not on your ship. She's on someone else's ship. Mm-hmm. So she's not going to have two captains. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work, and that would actually uh, render society chaotic. So these sorts of things. I'm just trying to say there's a distinction. There's a difference between these three f- periods. And so that is the dating phase. Mm-hmm. And it's a much wiser than the proven failed dating before the compatibility checks, before the families get to know each other, before um, the due process and due diligence is, is taken. So I hope some of that all over the place No, no, helps. I love that, yeah. And it's cool because even when I like talk to a bunch of friends, obviously, who aren't Muslim, and I'm like, oh, like, you don't really know someone until you live with them. All right, and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But then you're telling me you're going to move in, live with them for two, three years, and then get married after. But then I'm thinking, but what happens if it doesn't work? There's actually a very interesting phenomenon of people that live together for years, 10 years. Then they tie the knot, right? They just go to the chapel and they get married and whatnot, and they get divorced within six months to a year. There's really something there that is worth exploring by those people that have this sort of skepticism. Yeah. Uh, in any case before this becomes a marriage podcast. (laughs) No, I get it. So one thing I definitely wanted to ask too was um, kind of going into this is the misconceptions of Islam, right? Because again, some people won't even know, like, oh, forced marriage, arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, I'm like, dude, no one's getting forcibly married. It's again, like you said, like arranged marriage is like, what is it? It's just, hey, this person could be good for you. Would you like to talk, meet him or not talk to him? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And even when my mom and dad were getting to know each other, I remember them telling me a story where it was like, someone was like, oh, this guy wants to talk to you. And she's like, mom's like, nah. That's it. And then my dad tried again. He's like, no, I would really like to talk to her. And it was just to talk, have a conversation. It's not like it's now I'm trying to get her in bed. No, it's just to have a conversation where it's in front of the family's interaction. But then she, my mother had the decision of, okay, fine, let me talk to him. Yeah. Okay, we can talk once. At the end of the day, it's, it's their life, right? Mm-hmm. Their life. Uh, and so no one has absolute authority in Islam. People need to understand that. No such thing as absolute authority for anyone but God. Mm-hmm. And then for the sake of social cohesion and to to avoid sort of the breakage of family bonds, and also decision paralysis. Mm -hmm. God gave degrees of authority for certain people in certain contexts, Mm -hmm. right? So when the imam bows, you bow, like in the masjid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of when when there's like a a deadlock in the family, sort of just defer to the father, and we will hold him more accountable than the rest of you. Mm -hmm. It's like a two-way street. And so that's just the way it works. In Islam, we're even taught that a parent can't force their child to eat something they can't bear to eat. Mm-hmm. Like they're not just being finicky; like they're they're gagging, right? Yeah, they so don't like it. it. Yeah. You can't tell me no. Broccoli is a must. No, it's not a must. <laughs> <laughs> you figure out another green that has you know whatever broccoli has iron. Yeah, and a spinach has iron. Uh, so that's the idea. The notion of like a woman being forced to marry and like there, there's actually a beautiful hadith. If this is sort of a, a concern for people, besides the annulment the Prophet did uh, multiple times, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, the Prophet himself went. To propose to Zainab, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her. And she told him, "No, mm-hmm. not till I I ask my Lord. Like I want to pray on it." So it's like the Prophet himself could not sort of like you know, <laughs> and like he had the green light. Had the green light. Can you yeah. imagine? Yeah. No, I love that. And so going off of all this, if there's one thing, and you Umm want... Salama, I'm so I'm so sorry. Uh, Umm Salama, another wife of the Prophet, Salam, same thing. Mm-hmm. She said, "No, I'm not marrying you. I'm older. I'm an old woman. I got kids. She was a widow." Mm-hmm. I got kid, and you know, I have kids, and I'm a jealous woman. You're not gonna be able to handle me. <laughs> and he sort of had to persuade her. Is the point? He had to talk her through it. He said, "Listen, I'm older than you. Your kids are my kids. I want to take care of your family. That's why I'm, you know, mm-hmm. coming through the front door." 
Uh, and I'll I'll ask God to mitigate some of your jealousy. I'll ask God to help you with that one. Yeah, that's and beautiful. It's, and it's cool too that even like you're saying, like even the prophecy of Pano had those issues as well. The same way a guy can have to be like, again, you have to go through the game. And the last thing I'll say, we'll say about the whole like marriage thing. I was just literally just recently watched a TED talk about this, and it was explaining when men fall in love versus when women fall in love. And it was explaining men fall in love when they commit, because that's when the like the testosterone lowers. The, the right hormones increase and women fall in love when they have like the sexual relations. And that is when they dive in deep head in because the oxytocin levels will increase. Mm. So it's interesting that the men fall in love when there's a commitment. And it wasn't just that you're saying the marriage or the marriage versus the dating. It's whenever the commitment happened. Not where it's marriage yeah. or dating because say they're dating – and they committed to date or be with that of person. Of course, they were having intimacy. But now it's like legally locked in that there's yeah. a fi- financial responsibility, mm-hmm. right? There's a commitment. Exactly. And then once he committed, even if it was relationship or marriage, whatever it was, that's when the man fell in love. Mm. But with the woman, again, she fell in love when the hormones got released, again, through sexual relations, all these mm. different types of things. So then it made me kind of chuckle and laugh because I was thinking, Islamically, it does it the right way, where then it protects the woman because the woman has more to lose in the modern dating society, not the man. Because the man doesn't have to commit and he can sleep around, right? Oh, he's having fun. But the woman who gets hurt, the woman who d- gets devastated. So then the marriage system in and of itself protects right. he's, the woman. He's have, you're trying to say he's having relations but no commitment. No commitment. So there's not the, the emotional wounds of the separation as exactly. much. Whereas the woman, because sort of she allowed herself to be sexually active, mm-hmm. She's committed, she's emotionally invested every yeah. single time, which means she's sort of wounded mm-hmm. every single time. So it made me think. It's above my pay grade. I'm just yeah. trying to understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so it made me think like, oh, so in a way, like it, this is why it protects the woman more. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's really cool because then when the man commits, then he gets to be with the woman. And then, like you said, then it grows in a halal way. Let me, let me bust some guy's chops uh, <laughs> while I'm here on the other side of this coin, right? Yeah. Uh, it is said, and like you said, right now it is a buyer's market uh, in the sense of like there's no reason I have as many options as I as – in the past, women used to force men to commit. You're not going to have a relationship with mm-hmm. them. I, w- even outside of Islam, like even Western yeah, culture yeah, yeah. until very recently, the, the, sort of the taboo of sort of uh, – da- They held reporting. the key in a lot. Right, yeah. And so like you got to prove yourself first, right? Be a warrior. <laughs> Be successful in business. Be Show me something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh and that is gone now. And so with this free range and it's a buyer's market, it means sort of the value of women has been has imploded in the eyes of men and society. Women are put under the impression that they've, uh, they've been freed. And in reality, what has happened is free access to her mm-hmm. uh, without the corollary, without the cost uh, yeah. has been sort of spawned. It's, it's very tragic. But on the guy's side, because society has not forced men to commit – we have a manhood crisis, Mm -hmm. right? That's a reality because we're at odds with nature. I'm not saying that a man needs to get married at 14, but his testosterone starts bubbling at 13, 14 years old. You're telling me, you know, the average age is 29, 28 Mm -hmm. for men and women to get married in society, Western society. Today? today. Yeah, last I checked. This was 2012 statistics, but they only only check them once every few decades Mm -hmm. in general. So, or at least in the studies I've come across. And so you're telling me Average age is 29, and I'm getting hormonal at 14. Do whatever you want. Man up as much as you want. You're still not getting married for 15 years, right? That's really what society is saying. Yeah. And so why should I man up? There's no incentive anymore, Mm -hmm. right? I have, number one, free access to girls, and I have free access to girls that don't even exist in real life. It's called pornography, Mm -hmm. right? Even the models now have to sort of be like, uh, what do they call it, airbrushed and CGI'd and everything. Yeah. The, the, this stuff doesn't even exist in real life, yeah. right? And so real life is accessible because there's no sort of moral restraint. There's no God-fearing, you know, uh, ethos in society. And you have the fantasy world. Uh, and you have video games and you have money and vacationing. So I was like, okay, why should I man up? And then sort of you fast forward, everyone's complaining about the there's no good men in 30 society. 30-year-old man-child, right? Yeah. The, the tantruming uh, adult male. Yeah. We we did this together. Mm-hmm. We we created this monster together, and so something has to change. And yeah. the world needs Islam. What can I say? 
Yeah. I'm not saying they need to get married at 14, but give them a reasonable trajectory. I mean, I, I actually have an Egyptian parent mm-hmm. who came to me uh, not knowing that his son had already come to me. Mm-hmm. His son was 24. Uh, and he came to me to convince his son to not marry this woman. Mm-hmm. And this woman was a good sister, but she wasn't Egyptian. Uh, and so the, the father is losing. It's as if like his kid was sort of, you know, terminal. Yeah. <laughs> like it was over, like the end of the yeah. world. Yeah. And he's like, you have to stop him. You have to convince him. He's not listening to me. You got to talk to him. And so I'm going to tell you something. You're going to get upset at me. But I told him that if he is going to fall into illicit relations to marry her, even if his parents don't approve. He was like, what? You did what? I was like, listen, with all due respect, he has been trying to do the right thing restrain himself for 10 years now 14 is my marker Mm -hmm. and he's 24 you assumed he had it in him to wait till you got around to finding the person you think works for him so you miscalculated at the end of the he's like but she's not a good match he's gonna get a divorce i'm not vouching for her i don't even know her but at the end of the day in my eyes a divorce is better than his dean being lost when people go down that path most of them don't come back god forbid these things for a reason these evils are a slippery slope and they also create a sense of patheticness in people it's like oh man i can't believe i did this so i might as well do everything else and it becomes sort of the new normal for them so i'm sorry but i told your son to do that so far they haven't gotten a divorce alhamdulillah (laughs) Alhamdulillah. they have two children now alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah. that's awesome it's cool too that again being able to step into the, I can be like your friend as a community member, but then this is me turning on sheikh mode, or this is me yeah. turning on advice mode, where I have to... St- it's not like always that. easy. Yeah. That guy attended my aqiqah. Mm-hmm. So when I was, for those that don't know what aqiqah is, you know, there's a little bit of a banquet and gratitude to God when there's a newborn. Mm-hmm. Newborn's like seven days old or 14 days old in Islam. So he, when I was seven days old, <laughs> attended that <laughs> banquet. So it was not easy. Yeah. Yeah, he was like you're telling your elder, your yeah, I'm more, right? That hey, by the way, I'm yeah. telling you what not, yeah. what's not, and that's awesome. And I wanted to ask you if there's one thing to the viewers that you wanted to share, like a misconception of Islam that you kind of wanted to talk about, that you think is kind of a misconception that you wanted to share knowledge on. What would it be? I mean, statistically, the two greatest uh, misnomers regarding Islam um, today, at least is their treatment of women and their treatment of the other, like a Mm non-Muslim. And there are reasons for this, and the Western world especially has trauma regarding religious intolerance because of how intolerant the church was. Mm -hmm. So they're still reeling from that, and they generalize that stereotype on all religions. Uh, And so people owe it to themselves to to break out of the echo chamber. Uh, Like uh, Now is the, the easiest time to do it. Because you've been told that Islam is evil and they're heartless men who kill children and they need to be suppressed and their nations sort of need to be under control. And and then Gaza happened, mm-hmm. right? And everyone's saying, you know, terrorist this, terrorist that, Hamas, 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 Hamas. But all we're seeing is dead children, dead children, dead children, dead children, dead children, as I read recently, right? On the Muslim side, mm-hmm. right? And so... The idea of like people think that you said earlier that they have uh, this sort of luxury or assumed luxury that there will be no accountability on the individual level. And so mm-hmm. they project blame on everyone else. That's been happening for a long time. And the cat's out the bag. And the ones pointing fingers have, you know, as they say, have three fingers pointing back at them right now. Yeah. And so maybe everything else you've been told about Islam needs to be reconsidered. Why are people working so hard to keep Islam from you? Uh, There are political reasons, there are financial reasons, there are uh, lifestyle reasons. You were told that the purpose of life is happiness, and the way to happiness is money. And all of that is a lie. You know, so you owe it to yourself to discover Islam. You owe it to yourself uh, to not be spoon-fed lies by mainstream media. Uh, We believe in one God, alone without any partners, the creator of the heavens and the earth, unique in his perfection perfect in his oneness, the most loving, the most merciful, the most just, the most wise. We believe in all of the books he's revealed. Muslims believe in the Torah, the original one that was revealed. Muslims believe in the evangel. 
the original one that was revealed. And because people keep tampering for convenience, political maneuvering or otherwise, God revealed the final book, the Qur'an. We believed in all these scriptures. This is the only intact scripture left that tells us to worship God with all our heart, mind, soul, uh, love him dearly, and live for him and by him. And the way to do that is to try our very best to emulate the best of us, which were the prophets of God that we also believe in. We believe in Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we believe Jacob's name is Israel, even if it was appropriated by, mm -hmm. a, by a racist apartheid project. Yeah. To try to validate what can never be justified. What do we believe in? David and Solomon and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them all. They yeah. were the best people that ever breathed Earth's air. And they're the ones that show us how to live for God and to prepare for the day we all have to be brought back to life. We were dead and God brought us to life. We were nothing. And so when we die, we should be sure that we will come back to life one more time to answer for everything and meet God's justice or meet his mercy and those eager for his mercy and to be with him for eternity. That's called paradise. Uh, and that's it. That Those are essentially the six pillars of the Muslim's faith uh, that I hope the viewers will take the opportunity to uh, learn about. Yeah, no, I love that. And I know obviously talking about the Philistine, like what's going on in Philistine and Gaza and all these different things. And it's interesting you say that because all my life I've always seen how the news talks about Muslims, right? And like you said, after 9-11, right? Being a Muslim and after 9-11 was not like, hey guys, I'm Muslim, right? You're not going to walk around yeah. saying there it. There were non-Muslims attacked for being assumed to be Muslim. Yeah, like, imagine I, what it was like to be a Muslim. Exactly. I know um, my best friend, he's Sikhi, so like they, they wear turbans and stuff. And he was telling me, he was like, dude, even after that, like I noticed that there was racism at, at people like that were Sikhi. And, like, they're not even Muslim. Mm -hmm. They're just brown people. Get them. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. but it's so backwards. And... I always look at this and I was like, again, when I started asking my mom and dad, mom, 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 like, why are we hated so much in the media? Like, and I got so mad or like anytime there's like a terrorist attack or someone does something, I'm like, please don't be a Muslim. Please don't be a Muslim. I'm like begging. Like, that's the first thing I'm thinking of because I don't want them to say. Because we know we'll be held to a double standard. Yep. And then, but when it's a, a white person, it's this mental health crisis is why he shot up that school. Or when it's a black person, they call them a thug. Though they're criminals. And you just see how like how terrible it is when certain groups do things. Oh, a Spanish person did it or a Mexican person did it. Oh, it's because they came from it's illegal immigration borders. Issue. Immigration. Yeah. And it's all these different things. But then when a white person does it, oh, we need to get them help. It's the mental health crisis. But then it's so funny because then I, I remember the Boston Marathon uh, bombing had happened. And the Snarner brothers and all these different things. Oh, they're Muslim. They're radicalized. All these different things. And I followed that story so intently because I was so distraught when I was in high school. And I was so upset about it because I was like, no, like, I don't want people to think of Muslims this way because Muslims don't do this. And, and it was so, like, hurtful to me because then I noticed that people looked at me funny when I would walk around like, a couple months after. And then I remember my dad was a taxi driver in New York during 9-11. Mm -hmm. And he told me it was dangerous for him to be still the tax driver in New York. He says, I started getting less rides. People would like see me and they'd be like, no, next, I want the next one. But I mean, everyone knows like what taxi drivers are predominantly all these Middle Eastern You're going to be waiting for a while. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be waiting for a while. And I, I started thinking like, wow, like it was this stigma. And then going back to that, even now people are waking up, right? People are like, wait, the media, everyone knows that media is all owned by one two people companies and that they're not going to give them the best news and the best information so people go out of their way to find their own information and they're like wait so they're just bombing these people and we're okay with it why are we sending billions of dollars to ukraine why are we sending billions of dollars to israel why are we doing this and people start asking like you said those questions because knowledge is so accessible now and because of it like you said the cat's out of the bag everyone's like oh so they're just lying and then one by one you start noticing more and more people are flying to islam accepting islam and again like you said like clarity is coming to light, right? Everyone is seeing it. So I kind of wanted to even ask you again, what's like that one or a couple things that you kind of are taking away from this whole like situation that's happening again, like that's being brought to light with Philistine? I mean, there is so much. I began with the fact that people should take the opportunity to discover Islam because on the individual level, whether a person witnesses in their lifetime justice, uh, or not, or is a part of, you know, demanding justice for the oppressed of all walks of life. Uh, that does not change the fact that we all have an appointment we will never uh, be absent from, will never escape, which is the day of judgment, right? The day of resurrection. So we begin there. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, it is quite fascinating how social media has been such a game changer. You know, social media has so many ills. <laughs> yeah. beyond measure, beyond the scope of a single podcast. Uh, but 
for all this time, there was a monopoly on the narrative. And now it's just not working because the Zionist side is telling the world what's happening like they've always been. They've been invested in mainstream media to the end of it. And, and the Palestinian side is showing the world what's happening. And so there's like no contest, right? Yeah. Uh, whatsoever. And so this is a, this is a big takeaway. Uh, part of being creative, part of not underestimating yourself, part of the strength in numbers in general, even off of social media. Um, the uh, the suppression, the censorship, the the silencing that's happening on social media as well uh, is very telling. I mean, I, I wish you know people have different primary motives for uh, waking up in this la- in the last hundred and twenty days. Like the average American that is pro Palestinian right now or sort of like sympathizing with the cause, none of them are pro Hamas, right? Yeah, 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 that's not the reason. Um, it is either number one, their 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 numbers are getting together and saying, "Wait a minute! Like, how come we can criticize even Sue, the president of the United States, and we can't say a peep about Israel without sort of getting you know <laughs> run over by the yeah. anti-Semitic accusation?" There's so many if, laws that are in place, to right? Protect and that them. doesn't exist about America. Why does it exist about Israel? Number one, number yeah. two, people are, that are also thinking America first are are wondering, "Wait a minute! We don't have free health care. We don't have like free education." How come they do? Why are we sending them money? They should be sending us money. <laughs> yeah. Like, are we us or are we them? Like, oh, what? which one is the superpower here? Which one is like... And so uh, this is sort of the uh, first motive. The second motive are, and this is a wider sphere I'm imagining, uh, that people of conscience everywhere. You know, when I spoke earlier about the fitrah, our nature, uh, our nature intuitively recognizes a god yes it's like a a blurry and it needs revelation to sort of like you know really mature that nature of ours but the seed is there Mm -hmm. god is the ultimate good and so part of our nature is that we incline to good we have a conscience we have this general idea of moral principles like no maybe the application we're going to disagree on because we need revelation right but like we all we're all pro-justice and sort of the the gravity of the injustice has become so clear to any person whose conscience is half awake Mm-hmm. Right, right now, and thirty-five thousand people, man, fifteen thousand children, people picking up their babies in pieces, yeah, literally in plastic bags, yeah, uh, just limbs hanging. This is this is unthinkable, you know. Uh, in the past, uh, you you read about like atrocities and massacres and genocides and ethnic cleansing with this aloofness of the history book, right? It's like emotional distance. Something happened a hundred years ago or fifteen hundred years ago. People are live streaming their murder in yeah. mass yeah. right now. And it's not just written in history book where you read about it later, but you're visually seeing, oh my God, this is happening right, right before my eyes. And so I have a little bit of a, of a gripe with the term like faith in humanity, mm-hmm. but I do believe that God created humanity with inherent goodness. And I think it's, it's time for us to all hover around that inherent goodness that is still alive in so many people. Uh, and there's no time like the present to write the course and uh, reclaim the narrative and demand from the powers that be uh, that they acquiesce and they do right by the dignity of every last human being. You know, we realize that this whole more uh, human rights project was just verbiage, right? So mo- most of the time that is wielded by the strong selectively against the weak. That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's time we, we really... Uh, double down our commitment to these things. Are they lip service? Are they just sort of like uh, uh, social intelligence in front of a camera? Or do we really live? Do we really believe these things? Mm-hmm. No, I love that. And kind of going off of that, there's a question I wanted to ask you because it's a really difficult time in our society now. And to even be a Muslim in the West, to be an American citizen, right? You get the privilege of voting, right? As an American citizen, mm-hmm. you get to do this thing called voting, right? It's your pr- it's a right, you know, it's a God-given right to vote for the President of the United States. And I kind of talk to different Muslims about this, and I'm like, okay, it's probably going to be Trump to win the Republican nominee because it's just, he is, he is Trump. He's going to do it, right? And most likely going to be Biden. So... I look at this and I'm like, okay, so Joe Biden obviously is getting funded by Israel more than anyone out of any candidate. He clearly is funding and supporting genocide, right? So as a Muslim, you can't go, oh, let me go vote for Joe Biden as a Democratic person or not, right? So you don't feel right voting there. But then Trump also is of the same category. And you can be like, maybe he's better in this regard or this regard, right? But with both of them, 
it doesn't feel like you're doing the right Islamic choice. So as an American citizen who's also Muslim, what what's like the situation, this dilemma that we're kind of in? Do I vote? Do I not vote? So that's kind of a question I wanted to ask you. Paralyzed are the purists. If you're trying to be too pure in a world that is inherently uh, complex and sort of uh, muddied and polluted, you're not going to be able to do anything, right? Uh, I would not be able to sell a cup of coffee because many of the people I sell coffee to will be uh, awakened by the caffeinated drink to do whatever evil they're going to do today, right? Yeah. And so uh, that's just a very easy example. I know someone's going to refute that in 10 seconds. But that is like, the idea. Yeah. If you technically think about it, it's a philosophical argument. It's called a slippery slope argument. Like mm-hmm. how much will you not do because it's not 110% pure? Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. Islam is based on, uh, of course, we have virtues, mainstay virtues, right? We're not sort of uh, purely pragmatic. Uh, but we do have imperatives, ethical imperatives. Um, so balancing between our values, which many purists are looking at because they are pure values, with sort of the realities on the ground. Like even think about even like the texts of Revelation and then the context in which we're going to apply them. The Revelation told you, you know, there is built-in flexibility, as I me- we mentioned earlier with the job and the finance examples. Yeah. So likewise here, if you cannot get something, uh, you know, uh, that is 100% pure, can you avert something that's... 2% pure and get us the 70%, it's until mm-hmm. you get your 70%. Don't say that you're opting for 30% evil mm-hmm. when you push for 70% good. Yeah. Say you're averting 98% evil. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the idea, right? Yeah. Like in, the, our scholars would, would give the example of, because this is an agreed upon principle in Islamic law. Whenever you can't, maximize the good, minimize the evil. Pros, cons, right? Yeah. They used to give the example of, let's imagine there are two, uh, two rulers, politicians, one of them is known for his brutal uh, barbarism. He's a cutthroat murderer. And the other one is uh, like something less than murder. A rapist, a thief, the seven, the third, right? Mm-hmm. You're obligated, if you've actually verified it, you're obligated to support this guy. And no one has the right to tell you, even if they did. In God's eyes, you are not sinful for supporting a rapist and a thief. Mm-hmm. You are rewarded for... Not choosing the the worst, the lesser. Keeping the murderer Mm -hmm. off of people's necks, Mm -hmm. right? Because there's just no choice, right? Like the one that's pillaging and murdering and running through the land. And And so you you did not, in a vacuum, opt for someone evil. You opted for them when there was no foreseeable choice between them and someone more evil, Mm -hmm. right? That's sort of from the Islamic perspective. And that is where the justification for voting comes from from an Islamic lens for the scholars that say it is permissible. That's, how, that's their line of argument. And it's very reasonable, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it seems very reasonable, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the second factor is strategy. Like, every, like the people, there is a huge running, you know, campaign within the Muslim community right now called Abandon Biden, mm-hmm. right? Punishing this man uh, for uh, being so shamelessly uh, uh, supporting, you know, the mm-hmm. genocide. Uh, with the money, with the weapons, with the coverage, with the protection, with the vetoes in the United Nations. Like was, can you imagine like 152 votes against two and then those two actually are able to overturn? And Yeah. So whatever that number was, it was something like 150-something yeah. to single digits, right? A lot to a little. Yeah. The whole world said no and America said no. Everyone back off, you know? So uh, he, this is the path he has chosen for himself. We are not sort of, the people that say this are not naive. They're, they're not saying sort of like that, that Trump is some like, you know, some righteous, pious mm-hmm. believer or that his camp is sort of, you know, uh, just uh, a group of angels, right? But they are doing this from the perspective, just to appreciate the perspective, whether you agree with it or not, is that we will no longer continue to say whoever treats us locally nicer. Yeah. Uh, then the other guy, if you can just be a little less nasty to us than the other guy, you have our vote. It's like the identity politics that people Yeah, it's play. like, no, we're going to hold you accountable. Even if we don't get the ideal guy we want, right, mm-hmm. uh, uh, this time around, we will not let someone do to us, you know, what Biden has consistently done here without punishing him. We, we are saying we know that we make a difference and we know that – you cannot accept our vote for take our vote for granted. Mm-hmm. We know that we don't need to be the majority to make a difference either. We just need to in the swing states, for example. Yeah. We just need to 
turn that lever and we are enough. And we know we're powerful because boycotts work. We've seen ourselves actually and make so an impact. And so what's going what's gonna to be, I think, consequential come November, and then I have to say that November is not the vital end. We all have to remember that. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> this is not even a Democrat Republican issue. Like, yeah, the APAC, you know, American Israeli lobby, is bipartisan. They have both of them, sort of. Yeah, in, they it's the money that hundreds makes hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Yeah, and so this is just a matter of uh, making our stance known and continuing to build on that for the future. Uh, we're not just accepting the lesser, you know, uh, candidate. No, we are demanding a certain something. These are important to us. You don't have our vote without them. Mm -hmm. We're turning the table on them yeah. is the idea for the abandoned Biden campaign. And so what I'm worried about come November, that if we can't pull this off, uh, th they're banking on us not being able to get our act together and pull this off, right? Mm -hmm. To mobilize in one direction and actually be consequential in terms of the, yeah. uh, the, the, the greater vote. Yeah. And so I remember in the primaries, there was a discussion on the day of the elections in many Muslim WhatsApp groups. Like, yeah, but do we write it in the ballot or do we choose the other guy or do we abstain and boycott the vote to begin with or so on and so forth? That's not going to work. I remember just getting on the, one of the biggest groups and I said, guys, there's two hours left in the poll. Do you think we have the luxury to each deploy our sort of varying levels of political discretion? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to just accept that whatever we do together is better than anything we can do separated. Yeah. Right? And that is why me personally, I keep saying us, and I'm slipping and saying us with the Biden, because that's what I'm, I'm choosing. I'm choosing that there are people that know this better than me, mm -hmm. and now is not the time to public-facing sort of splinter. Mm -hmm. Whatever those who are more politically savvy uh, and understanding of the dynamics of, uh, of uh, the political process will say, I'm just going to acquiesce and defer to them. And I'm asking, calling on all Muslims to suggest the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can't have an open-ended conversation. You have to disagree and commit. Once we're all committed, we will be heard. Yeah. No, I, I, I really do like that. And again, for me, there's a politician that I actually really liked. And I was like, I was 10 toes down with this guy. Yeah, I might sort and of, there's, yeah, the, 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 the green voter. <laughs> there are people like Stein yeah, and, and uh, West, Cornell mm -hmm. West and these guys. But if that's not sort of the strategy of the mainstream, then it's... Th my, I want to say my personal opinion is irrelevant because yeah. even if it's correct, it will dilute our multiplied force. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. And the, the politician I support I really liked in 2020 was uh, Andrew Yang. And I lo I was listening. I was watch I was going through like a rampage of his podcast. I was like, binging uh -huh. on it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, you're right. Uh huh. You're right. I'm like, I like that. And I'm just sitting there thinking, like, I've never heard so a presidential candidate so eloquent and so like intelligent with his problem. Solution, problem, solution. Mm. And I might not agree with everything he does. I didn't, didn't agree with this or this, or, right? But I can sit there and be, on, like, again, like you said uh, to me before, that's a sponge, right? So it's like you allow what comes into your heart. Versus you have, what, yeah, of course. You have your filter as a Muslim. And he said this in a recent interview, and they asked him. He was like, he was like imagine where we don't, imagine going to the voting station. You're looking at two candidates, and you're like, it's so hard to choose between them. I like this person and I like this person. And everyone's laughing. And it's like, when's the last time we had that? When you go to the polling station, you're like, I like them both so much. Yeah. Like, And that is kind of like what we should strive to have is people that we actually like. like. These are two options. You know what I mean? And like, I think Americans in and of itself, whether you're Muslim, not Muslim, whatever it is, there's a, such a large disaffected voting community because you're sitting there thinking, I don't want to vote for like – crap and then more crap you know it's like it's so hard to have that and like to jump in yes this is what i'm voting for mm -hmm. so i think like again you kind of clarify on that to me it's you know it gave me a different perspective where it's okay you know it's it sucks that this is the reality but you still need to have an impact together as one rather than separated as none oh, fantastic well put no i love that and one of the questions i wanted to ask you is um where do you kind of see the world again going in five years again just being where we are now and then kind of Looking and diving into the future, where do you kind of see it going? Oof. God knows. <laughs> yeah. God knows. And I, I don't just say that in a jaded sort of way. Uh, and at the same time, I think we need to be careful not to uh, be too preoccupied with this. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day... Uh, we should be as involved. I know this is not the answer like that that, that will sell views. <laughs> no, I know that's not your objective. No, this but is the right at the end of the day, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked a similar question. He was asked, when is the day of judgment? 
Yeah. Like how soon into the future is, you know, the culmination uh, of planet Earth. Um, and he refused to answer. Rather, he directed them to a far wiser question. He said, what have you prepared for it? Because yeah. if you drop dead today, there's your day of judgment. That's it. Your mm -hmm. judgment is, is locked in. It's started. Yeah. Uh, and so the more practical question is what can we do, right, in the next five years? And that is going to be contingent upon us assessing where we stand in our little corners of the world, right? Uh, I have things I know, which are my duties as an individual, as a community member, as a uh, constituent in society. And I have things I don't know, which is how exactly that's going to play out in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So I would think that it is prudent and wise to focus more so on the things I do know than the things I don't know. Yeah. Uh, does it seem like things are accelerating? I think we can all agree on that. There's actually prophecies uh, about the future. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, uh, stated uh, with just incredible precision that we're watching unfold. You know, yeah. about you know a year feeling like a month, and a month feeling like a week, and a week feeling like a day. And towards the end of time, uh, there will be sort of this rapid passage of time. And even think of like travel and locomotion, technology, and yeah. you know, everything. There's so Is many it, little minor signs and prophecies that are already come true, like the adba, adba where it's like dishes will communicate to one another. But There's so much, uh, you know, in that genre of a hadith, it's an undeniable proof of his, of his prophethood, the traceability of it, the plethora of it. And so uh, there are signs uh, of the day of judgment coming type thing, uh, mm -hmm. or sort of like a uh, theme. Uh, but in general, also in the world, there, there are signs of great volatility in the world and that we are turning the corner as a global civilization. Mm -hmm. What that's going to mean, we don't know. Will things get harder? Most probably. Mm -hmm. Can we get better prepared and stronger? Absolutely. Things won't get easier, but we can get stronger. Mm -hmm. And so that is by reinvesting in our faith and knowing that it's not faith in the sense of like, I just sort of believe it and I have no reason to. The term faith has a certain connotation, even like in English, right? That's why some Muslims, Muslim scholars don't like the term faith to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's like a justified belief. It's not a faith. Mm -hmm. um, so investing in our faith, meaning our Islam, our Iman, our certainty, our Yaqeen, and contributing to the world uh, because of our faith and mm -hmm. in light of our faith. Um, there are Muslims out there that are contributing and they happen to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's neither the ideal way to do it, though we appreciate the effort, uh, nor is it uh, the most sustainable way to do it. There is nothing that will give you resilience like true certainty in God and living irrespective of your circumstances with the best assumptions of him. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people of Gaza are, you know, the the splitting image of that. Yeah. And that's what the world is seeing. And so we all need a little bit of that. It's almost like God has planted these people in our era to reinstate our faith in faith, right? Like, yeah. wow, this is real. This is not sort of you happen to believe it or not. I'm the spiritual type. No, we all have a spirit. Some of us abuse our spirits by depriving it of a connection to its maker and a relationship with him and devotion to him. And some of us, our spirit is is legendary. Yeah. So may God help us all and strengthen our spirits with, with proper faith in him. I mean, no. I hope to be a part of that. Yeah. To answer your question in brief, I mean, that's kind of why I'm involved in faith work and community work. And I hope it'll keep me, uh, hopefully, from slipping too far, hopefully on the up and up. And I hope I can sort of offer that to others as well. No, I love that. And just going off that, like I know you're part of like founding members, you're part of the Akin Institute, correct? So what was the, the inspiration behind like doing that? Dismantling doubt, cultivating conviction, inspiring contribution. That's mm -hmm. essentially uh, our, our startup mantra when we started. And yeah. of course, reclaiming our narrative is a part of that. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a very timely need once again, in the age of doubt, in the age of radical skepticism, in the age of losing faith in faith, yeah. uh, uh, both the Muslim community and wider society deserves, you know, uh, efforts like Yaqeen. And there, you see it even, you know, uh, an indication of this is that you see it in other organizations as well. Mm -hmm. There are institutes popping up around the globe and people are coming back to religion. They really are. Mm -hmm. They're realizing that, you know, all violence in the world is because of religion or sort of like all baseless beliefs are in religion. Yeah. It's like, well, look at us the past hundred years, you know? The grand modern human civilizations of the world are sort of, have created more atrocity than all of human history combined. We've killed more people. We have more suicide rates and antidepressants and sort of uh, racism and uh, the consumption of alcohol and, you know, uh, 
opioids and uh, marijuana. There is there's no end. You realize that there actually it is a black hole without religion, and so the resurgence of it uh, is something Yaqeen tried to catch early. Even though we all feel like we're late to the game and we're all reacting, but we want to turn the tide. No, I love that, and it's interesting too because I know I've always seen like videos on YouTube and stuff, and I'm like, I just love seeing like when that was being spread in really sweet ways, you know, where it doesn't have to be people on the streets yelling and screaming and arguing each other, but it's just, hey, I'm going to educate. Here's the knowledge. Take it if you can with what you will and allow it to go enter your heart, you know, and I think that's really beautiful. And it's cool because for me, I do very well with, again, like I don't mind when someone's, it may be a little screaming a little louder because sometimes that's the advice you need. And it was, I think Mufti Mink said this in one of his videos. He was like, I'm like the intro, Sheikh. So he's like, I'm like an intro where I'll talk about things, but softer right but then sometimes like you don't need my advice anymore you need someone to really tell you what have you done to prepare for the day of judgment like seriously think about it and i'm like you know what sometimes that is the advice you need to hear so it's kind of cool to they see like how you guys how you can like, even have like a balance of that as well where you know we, we, we appreciate the testimonial no of course we'll send, you can send us an invoice <laughs> we'll pay you for it <laughs> <laughs> and, we don't do that by the way oh my god where's the cameras <laughs> we've never done that never will no i love that but and it was, it's funny because I wanted to ask you like an unpopular opinion that you have, whether it be just Islamic, whether it just be I don't like pineapple on pizza. Like, what is an unpopular opinion you might have? That's a hard one. <laughs> I mean, so much of what we discussed today in the podcast is unpopular, right? Yeah. The world needs Islam. Happiness mm-hmm. is not the purpose of life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? Uh what have previous guests said? I'm so lame. Dude, no, no, no. It's funny. Some people, I, if some people have said things that I'm like, oh, really? That's a popular opinion. But I think someone had told me that um, Michael Jordan is better than LeBron James. <laughs> How's that? I don't even believe that, but I hope it stokes <laughs> enough controversy for you. No, all good. <laughs> I don't have a. I don't like actually the comparison of of goats. Yeah. All time greats. Yeah. Steph Curry is the best three point shooter in the history of the NBA. That's an easy one. Yeah. So I don't know how controversial that is, but you'll you'll always have a hater or a critic. someone to say this or that. No, I, I agree, and it's cool because even for me, like I'm like a fo- soccer fan football fan and everyone's like oh messi ronaldo but for me like i can say messi is probably the greatest player to ever play but i still choose ronaldo you know and everyone's like oh but why but ooh. i'm like yeah. dude everyone has preference no yeah. i love that and something that i always end with is i always ask what is your favorite quote and the quote you chose was it is only in the remembrance of god like the heart can find peace so i kind of want you to say go into your that quote and talk about it a little bit sure yeah we can close with that uh There is an infinite hole inside of all human beings uh, that we kind of reference in our discussions about the metaphysical yearning. That hole cannot be filled with anything else. And uh, we see that in the pains of people all around us. And, you know, Abraham Maslow, the, uh, the famous psychologist, he had his famous hierarchy of needs, what people need. Yeah, and you know, like once you have your physiological needs, like food and clothing and likes, you know, you you, you want shelter, you want sort of companionship, you want self esteem, and then you want self actualization. Uh, self actualization basically means after you've had self esteem, you know what you're good at, you want to live up to that. Like I I want to master what I'm good at and sort of like fulfill my potential, yeah. considering what I'm good at. Right, so self actualization. What many people don't know is that Maslow actually amended his hierarchy. It's not some conspiracy. Like, it's in writing, and people in the psychology world know this. Uh, He wrote that there's actually a a need that people uh, still uh, desire to fulfill even when they self-actualize. And he calls it self-transcendence, to transcend yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, to be part of something bigger than yourself. And that is the summary of why no one has inner peace today, because at the end of the day, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. self-actualization you're still centered on the self Mm -hmm. it's still self-centered yeah ego-centered yep and we were not created to worship ourselves yeah we were not created to live for ourselves we were created to live for that which is greater than ourself and that's why people also get into like selfless work like altruism and otherwise but even them they still report that they're unsatisfied many a times the most famous example is mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. she said like if you read her memoirs it was actually a big controversy after she passed will she be sort of uh, I don't know if the word is inducted, 
but uh, into sainthood. Will she qualify to be a saint when she spoke about the fact that she's not sure of what she's doing? There's something missing. Is my faith sort of real or not? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was something, there was a, that hole remained even with serving the greater collective of human beings. So greater than yourself, yeah. but not great enough apparently. Yeah. Because you were not just created to transcend yourself in whatever way. Because that could mean like, we are the universe. And that's why that stuff doesn't fulfill people. Yeah. The universe is bigger than me. That you were created to serve the greatest of all, not mm -hmm. just anything relatively greater than you. Mm -hmm. That's why you're created. And, that, yeah. and so Islam comes and tells you, this is how you remember God. This is, you're dysfunctional without it. This is what it looks like, how to have a meaningful relationship with him. Because even to say, you know, you're created to worship God. Okay, but how? I, I don't know. It's not very instructive. Yeah. But when Islam tells you, by the way, the reason you're feeling this way is because I have not created the jinn or the human, anybody except to worship me. Mm -hmm. And you will never have peace unless you're worshiping me. Like the verse that says you'll the, only through the remembrance of God, to remember him in practice, not just remember him like a reflective exercise. That's part of it. You want to be a thoughtful, mindful Muslim. Yeah. The Quran calls you to that. But to remember him in my behavior, my purpose, my potential, like I'm an agent of God in this world. I need to live up to that. This is the most fulfilling thing. Uh, and without which you will never have inner peace, without which you will not have fulfilled your purpose, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done. And so that is why it is very profound. Do you think about like, uh, I'll share with you one story to end. There's a, a friend of mine. I share his story a lot because it's very symbolic of this phenomenon. Uh, his name was Jason. Uh, he, a very intelligent young man, Albert Einstein School of Medicine. And he, I didn't do anything. He was ready. He came ready, had read up, and he really wanted to become Muslim. And so I just walked him through how to become Muslim, just to say the testimony of faith. He already believed in his heart. It took 10 seconds. He, you're not Muslim. Welcome to Islam. Then I tried to bring him to the mosque. And apparently he was very uncomfortable, very self-conscious, worried, am I going to do it right, and all this stuff. So uh, I kind of tricked him <laughs> into coming into the mosque one day. Like I pulled a fast one on him, halal conspiracy. <laughs> and I got him in. I'm like, hey, I'm going to miss prayer. Da -da -da, come with me quick. And so he's like, Ugh. and he came into the mosque. They were already praying. I jumped in the press. I said, listen, man, relax. Just you can sit on the side if you're not comfortable. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not praying. I'm not. I'm not. Just sat on the side. And so we prayed. And on the way out, I was like, so what do you think? He's like, that was amazing. I was like, amazing is like a little bit of like yeah, an yeah, exaggeration. Like, oh, right. What was amazing? Like you didn't even pray. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like you experienced it yourself. Uh, he said, I was like, what do you mean? He said, don't get me wrong. I've prayed my whole life. But this is the first time I've ever realized what it means to worship. I was like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. He said, when I pray, he was raised a Christian. He said, we're not told how to pray very much. So basically, it's something like this. When I need something, so already he feels un uh, uncomfortable with the fact that he's calling the shot. Like, it's my timing, not your timing. You actually have a time. You know when God wants you to pray. Mm -hmm. He goes, so when I need something, when I happen to remember God, as if we can do without him for a second, right? When I happen to, like, uh, remember him, I get on my knees, I put my elbows on the bed, and I do something like this. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to get good service, basically. You yeah. know, he's trying to like figure out is this and the amount of anxiety it gives you to wonder if you are doing it right. Yeah, it takes away from so much of the speed, sweetness of the spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like that person like uh, pacing through life, trying to figure it out through the energy crystal and through the yoga and mm -hmm. the. And he says, "But you guys actually know this is the way he put it. You guys actually know the procedure." That pleases God. And I actually, like, you know, you're born Muslim. You pray yeah, yeah, whether you yeah. liked it or not. You just pray. You take it for granted. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, my God. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. He goes, you actually know when and how, to, what God wants. And everyone has that inside. You just, whether you understand the feeling or not, at the end of the day, you want to know that God is pleased with you. And only Islam makes that possible. I love that. And it's even for me, like, I just took that in. And I'm like, wow. Like, I never even thought of it that way either. It's like we were given the blueprint. Not just yeah. follow it along, you know. It's like it's like people always see like architecture. Like he said, he said procedure, right? Because mm -hmm. again, like yeah, yeah, doctor. He's a doctor, right? right? So <laughs> it's like, like what the procedure to do this? Yeah. And, but it's interesting because it's, it's laid out. You just have to follow it. Mm -hmm. And I think even when you follow it, it's like you've gotten the rule book. You have the guidelines. Open book test, right? And just do it, and yeah. it's really cool because then 
when you do dive into and you do again like accept faith and accept that feeling you really do realize how simple it is mm. and i remember reading something and it was like oh like alcohol is impermissible but you can drink water you can drink mm. milk you can drink juice there's mm. so much more permissible than non-permissible and everything that isn't permissible isn't just for god but it's for your sake and it's really cool to when you see that in that regard then also then someone's saying Fantastic. you guys know how to pray there's mm. a there's a way like because again that guidance and there's a really cool thing where it's like if you ask Allah for one thing and you ask him for guidance, surely Allah will answer that. Absolutely. So I just want to thank you again for coming on to the podcast man. and being here and sharing a lot of your wisdom too and sharing those stories. Allah from us and I hope that the listeners benefit. Of course, inshallah. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode of the Oli Canoli Show. Again, today we had Sheikh Mohammed al Shinnawi and it was an incredible episode. And I really look forward to seeing you guys again for another episode. But if you guys want to be where he's sitting right now, in the description below, there will be the application to apply for the podcast. I'd love to learn about your story and have a conversation with you. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode, and I'll see you guys next time.